that's probably a good example of a project we talked about a lot in our personal life. Right. So yes. those kinds of things happen, but that's fun for us talking about ideas. I remember like in Connecticut driving and we were talking about the building siding. <laughs> like how do we make this building siding cool, but cost effective? We're like, we got to push the envelope. And we had such a great conversation and really the design came out of it. Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today, we are speaking with Elisa Winter Holben and Brandon, Brandon Holben from Winter Holben Architecture and Design based in Kittery, Maine. Winter Holben is a multidisciplinary studio built around integrating architecture and design to create innovative experiences. Elisa specializes in strategy and design and graduated from James Madison University in yes. Virginia. Yes. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Let me talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, with a Bachelor of Science degree, Brandon's focus is on high-performance contemporary design solutions that respond to the surrounding environment and has a degree in architecture from the University of Buffalo. Our interview today is sponsored by Main Home Design. Don't miss Elisa and Brandon's design theory in the upcoming September issue of Main Home Design. Thank you both for coming into the studio today. So you have a Bachelor of Science from James Madison University, mm -hmm. Harrisonburg, Virginia. Yes, very I good. I grew up in Stanton, Virginia. Oh, nice. And then went to high school in Newmarket, Virginia. So went to the Taco Bell a lot. Yeah. In that <laughs> strip on the mall there and then skiing at Massanutten. Or yes. snowboarding at Massanutten a lot. So <laughs> are, where are you guys from originally, both of you? I grew up in Newburyport, Mass. Oh, okay for most of my childhood. And how about you, Brandon? New England, but yeah, I <laughs> ended up graduating high school in Newburyport, which we never met at that time, but yeah. knew yeah. of the other. We were at the same high school for two years of our lives. Oh, okay, at the same time? Yeah, Brandon's one year ahead of me in school, so. And your paths didn't really cross at that point? No, right? we didn't hang out in the same circles. Right. Uh, but we did interact. Brandon was the captain of a hockey team and I was a hockey cheerleader. So oh, there's well. that, but we still didn't hang out much then. How do you do hockey <laughs> cheerleading? That would be pretty slippery. I think it's a dying sport. Maybe it's not so popular these days, but it was pretty fun. We were in the bleachers mostly. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, I'm, I met my wife in grade school. I think I was in sixth grade and she was probably in fourth grade and like we never hung oh, out or knew yeah. each other but it wasn't until college that i was like hey right. didn't you go to you know but yeah that was yeah a we got together when i was going to become a senior at james madison so it was a summer summers in between college at home in, in new england in yeah, new report yeah like in new report okay so I have to ask, how are you both so audacious to think you can run a business as a married couple? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Talk to me about I know. that. <laughs> people, people ask us that so, a lot. They're yeah. like, how is it really? Like, yeah. how in the world do you do it, right? Yes, yeah, we do hear that a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I think our answer is that we've, we've always, enjoyed working together you know even before we had a business we designed some things together our home our life uh, some projects and it's probably our favorite thing to do together is talk about design so that part of it is kind of comes naturally to us that's nice i think the business part is is a challenge a challenge for all business owners i think across yeah. the board but it's been a little trial and error, error since we started kind of figuring out whose skill set fits more with each piece of the business. And right. it's actually really great to sort of tag team running a business because we have kids and complex work and we um, we kind of each fill in the gaps and it, it works most of the time pretty well. Yeah. Do you think so? I'd agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so. I, I've been in two failed business partnerships. The commonality there is mm. me, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> it's but, good that you're honest about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, the thing I found was that uh, the first partnership mostly failed. A lot of it was because we were really good friends beforehand and there probably wasn't mm. appropriate boundaries that should have been there. Yeah, it's hard. But we also both had all the same interests and wanted to do the same things and didn't want to 
do yes. the other things. Yep. And our personalities were drastically different in how we uh, approach working. He, he was far more regimented mm -hmm. as far as, you know, you come in at this time, you leave at that time, at that point in his life. Now it's much different for him. And for me, I was kind of like, well, I'm going to surf this morning and right. I'll be in by 10 and I'll work late, you know, and that was, that was fine for me, but he had kids and it was, it was different at the time. You yeah. Know? It just didn't end up working Being partners, out. even if you're not married, is hard in a business. I think, I, think it, I wonder if it's harder yeah, or, or less. I would see, I always described it as it's like a marriage without sex, mm. <laughs> you know? So, so that's super. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. Super. There's, there's not that <laughs> that ability to be like, all right, well, yeah. You know. So yeah, that was. Uh, I think as you know, designers inherently love design, and I think it's hard for design types to run businesses. You know, in many cases, maybe creative types are. It depends where where you fall on that. But I'm kind of nerdy in that I like science and math, and and that's my I'm actually my degrees in science, and um, I like the business portion of things. Yeah. So. That's helped us a bit, you know, I think, but certain areas too, like creating marketing and business development and websites and all that. Those, those are things we often draw straws on and yep. figure out. <laughs> As in, it. all right, who has to do this? Can you do it this time? Like, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. but it takes a, it takes a village. For sure. So when, when the two of you, this is interesting to me, when, when the two of you do discuss and talk about design, how do you approach that? Is because I find when I'm around friends that are design aesthetic oriented, that we're often critically talking about things, mm -hmm. criticizing a lot of things. And I know this because my wife's not a designer mm -hmm. visual type by any stretch of the imagination. She's extremely talented and gifted with relationships and conversation and building mm -hmm. friends like that thing and like gardening and horses and outside activities. That's her deal. And when it comes to the aesthetic and the critical part of it, to her, it feels very much like we're just these negative people that are just like me thinking about things all the time. <laughs> and for her, it's like after a while, it's like, I hate being around so critical. I'm like, we're not criticizing things. Yeah. We're just talking I, about We them. love that kind of conversation. Maybe yeah. that's why we get along. Because we don't, I don't think a lot of it if you criticize what I'm doing. I kind of like, I like the mental challenge of it all. Yeah, we lose that, use that to promote, you know, prosper the work and you know, I feel like our different experiences and backgrounds kind of lend itself to that the conversation kind of being more open to where it's yeah you know, we kind of lend different things to the conversation and uh, we find that is a benefit to kind of living and we don't take together. it too personal like if you criticize yeah. or maybe yeah. I take it more personal than you sometimes <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Brandon's always correcting me when I design something that maybe isn't you know, completely architecturally up to code or uh, sound because he's got that background. And I love it when he points that stuff out because that's that's where really the, the magic comes in too. It's like, well, Lisa, that wouldn't actually work. And I'm like, oh, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's good to have the different. And I give a lot of perspective on architecture. I have a lot of commentary on certain things that I might look at that that you're not looking at the same way. And yeah, no, mostly we like that kind of conversation. So what are the two different strengths you think that you guys bring to the table? I mean, there's a diversity of our work too. That sort of lends itself to, you know, where we are, are multidisciplinary and Elisa leads the design projects and my architecture background, I lead the architecture projects. So that sort of naturally creates this distinction between who's, who's sort of in charge of that work. Mm -hmm. And then, um, the work that is more multidisciplinary that we do enjoy doing, uh, that's where it gets a little more muddled sometimes though. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, who's, who's doing what and who's in charge of what, but, um, it's, uh, the projects usually come out great. So, uh, yeah, the end product is good. And we're always sort of developing the process, uh, from project to project as well, I think. So, yeah, I mean, I think the the kind of work we do represents our two different and combined talents, right? I mean, you're yeah. you're an excellent architect, and I really admire the work that Brandon does. He's he's a good designer, but he's also so technically strong too. And um, the architecture that comes out of our firm is really innovative, and you know that architecture is just a deep 
profession and you have to have so much background and knowledge in certain things. So I think, I, you know, there's a lot of respect I have for that. And, and Brandon excels at that for sure. And um, I like more like the exp experiential, like emotional part of design and how do environments feel and how do they work and mm -hmm. how do the graphics and the layout and the wayfinding and branding and how does all that help make environments more impactful to people. Yep. So I kind of come at it from that side. So when we work on a project together, um, like we're working on a museum right now, I think it's a good example of how our two different strengths come together really well because it's so much technical and complex architecture in designing a museum. And then you also have to think of the emotion of the people and the the um, board and the fundraising and what it all means to those people. And we kind of bring it all together. So it's, it's, fun. it's an interesting thing that an architectural thought process has to contain in its head. There's all this kind of like, here's all the things I want to do and the feel I want. But then you have this burning, like, here's all the technical that you have. You can't just disagard. Right. You have it has to, to work. It. So <laughs> I kind of understand why a person with architectural training can come across so critical in so many ways because you've been trained to look at it not just aesthetically but also technically mm -hmm. and you just can't pull those apart once you have that training that maybe there's there's a lot of benefit of having kind of that that free radical floating around of like well this is the environment I'm going to create and design within here that mm -hmm. doesn't have to worry as much about all that technical stuff, you know? So maybe there's a there's a freedom of creativity that you bring to the table along with, you know, this staunchy guy that's just always like, technical, you know? <laughs> no, no. Free, not free radical, technical. that's a great way to describe it. I that. am a yeah. free radical. <laughs> the, free, the free radical. <laughs> we'll be working away or so we've got it all figured out, perfect. And she just walks in with the bomb, like, what if you just did that? And you're like, you're like, it like, blows oh. all up and you're like, you're like, you start to see it. Okay, she, yes, this is gonna work. It's gonna work better, yeah. <laughs> They right. hate me and then they love me later, right? Right. right. <laughs> Is it just the two of you in that firm? No. No, there's eight of us. Oh, wow. Nine. Nine, Nine of us. We have an intern. Nine. Yeah, we have an intern usually. From um, Syracuse University. We've enjoyed yeah. having interns. And she lives right here in Biddeford. She yeah. does live in yeah. Biddeford. Commutes, huh? Yeah. Shout well, out. she just started commuting. She had started the internship remotely. Right, of course. Right. And then we just started getting back to the office last week on this sort of staggered schedule. We're starting to get everyone. Yeah back in there we were like well, we can still have an intern even though it's crazy circumstances but yeah, so excited. we have an intern and then we have an interior designer an architectural designer two environmental graphic designers and a retail program manager and then sounds a, exciting and then we have a yeah. office manager and our and office manager, manager operations manager operations aaron manager. who gets a big shout out because she's done a lot to make sure we all could keep working remote wow. and here and there and everywhere so how do you deal with having that much overhead and everything because <laughs> i mean i've it's me and and my studio manager tim and just that i think about the numbers i need each month i'm a little like Ooh. yeah <laughs> we do kind of carefully plot it out um and we've talked about how big or small we want to be i, I like we really like the size we are right now because yep. In a way, we'd have two businesses, you know, we're one, but it's we have our architecture operations and design and um, they're both chugging along well. So we're able to have that much staff, you know, because the work is there and hopefully we'll keep being there. Right. So it's it's a nice manageable size and it allows us to do some bigger scale work because there's kind of like a, a capacity you need to be at to do it. Um, so that's been great. And. We, uh, we've had a lot of work um, in the retail banking uh, world and uh, with Bank of America as our client, which we're really grateful for. And they keep us very busy in the design side of things. So mm -hmm. that's nice because we have that happening all the time. And it really, it's super cool that a small firm like ours has a, a big client like that because it yeah. really keeps our firm chugging along and it allows us to do more community projects and uh, we like to donate our services where we can and, and do nonprofit work at reduced rates. And so we have this cool balance happening. 
No, that's really nice. Of big, you know, big client work and then smaller community projects. You might want to scoot in a little bit just to stay close to that mic there. But I'm drifting um, off. <laughs> what uh, what kind of work do you do for Bank of America? Um, so we're the creative partner for their uh, retail design, store design team. Mm -hmm. So we uh, manage the design standards for branding and merchandising inside the financial centers for the whole country. So we, wow. we maintain and we create the placement guidelines and standards for them. So we do that. And then we also uh, design new elements for them in that space uh, when they need it so things like wall coverings or brand applications or merchandising type elements we design those and then we also lay out um, design packages design intent for the branding and merchandising layout of spaces across the country uh, so we that really ramped us up this year uh, adding like a that huge work. amount of work yeah it's been a lot um, but really specialized they really yeah. love the way we show how these pieces fit into architecture it's really a unique niche of ours now um, how did you land that client well i had worked at without giving in away any trade secrets <laughs> my or, secret right. is my chocolate chip cookies no it's not that right. um <laughs> We, I've worked in retail banking for a lot, a good portion of my career. As I worked designing in, or actually working in? Uh, as a designer and then a creative director. Okay. And then I had a fairly large team at a, a large um, company that no longer exists. Uh, that was in New Hampshire. And one of our biggest clients was Bank of America. And I just built a lot of relationships yep. and... Uh, eventually they brought me in as a consultant and then um, as we built our firm together they we you know we were solid enough where they could give us a real partnership that's great so it's been a great evolution for me I have a lot of um, great colleagues and friends through all that work and uh, really appreciate the work and I think it's just really we work with a lot of big firms like Gensler and CBRE and it's so cool to be a part of that at our scale so it's been really rewarding it's hard work no doubt but it's really really yeah. great to do so uh what do you guys believe about the foundation of our reality that actually informs what you design like the to go as deep as you can go there <laughs> the foundation of our reality you mean like in current times or <laughs> just in no general? i mean like eternity <laughs> <laughs> like what what influences what what drives you like why do you care to create anything why do you care to make the world a better place yeah. through design what's this all mean yeah, like what's right. underneath it all for you <laughs> I, I i want you to answer this too but yeah. i i just think you know i used to design i started my career in graphic design and i was just kind of searching for what kind of design felt like purposeful enough to me, you know, before I kind of landed where I have now. And I think um, design has like a, especially in the built environment, it has a long lifespan in many cases, many, many years and many lives it touches. So I think first and foremost, like designing something that lasts and that matters through a long stretch of time is important. It's also a good design principle, right? You want to design things to last. So I think that the magnitude of that feeling that like this will um, affect people or make an impression on people for a long period of time, I think to me felt like a purpose, you know, to make it good. Mm -hmm. um, I know you have your some real strong architecture perspective on that. Oh, yeah, no, that's <laughs> good. It's well put. Um, yeah, I mean, we, uh, we we do a lot of different types of you know a lot of a lot of different type of work there's um and it, but adaptive reuse is one of these these ideas that we do a lot of and we believe in uh just from this uh energy and ecological standpoint is you know something that uh, all the work we do we try to push as much as we can into into every project uh at every opportunity and that's something that i feel like you know across the board we're always trying to do just just to um improve the the, you know, the energy use of every building and the sustainability you know looking at that um 
across the board uh, is is something that we we do well in uh, in including each project, and we've got a an array of you know portfolio of work of you know some some lead accredited projects and some that that just push pushes the envelope uh, as much as we can even when the client isn't uh, isn't asking for that. And that's something that um, is important to us, you know, that we really do believe in. And um, I feel like that's that's kind of like creating this more efficient way to live is sort of this this idea that I've always. Mm -hmm. It's always sort of drawn me to architecture. Uh, what do you mean by a more efficient way to live? Just, just look, you know, always, always looking at your surroundings and thinking of how you can improve that from if, if it's, you know, the water filter in your <laughs> sink to the, you know, just, just ways to constantly improve your, your habitat, you know, living, working, and, mm -hmm. um, and just thinking of that, just these creating these places that are, are are, are more efficient and uh, mm -hmm. a better experience to, to live, work, and play in. That's sort of, you know, we, we love that idea and those types of projects uh, are, uh, are, are a great uh, experience for us as designers to work with. How do you guys balance live, work, and play? Because when I, would, when I was starting out as a photographer, I had a home office just in one of our bedrooms. Sure. And like mm -hmm. work never ended because of that but you guys are working together so you're constantly around work in that you're just around each other <laughs> yeah. especially like, now <laughs> yeah like More how so do you now. yeah yeah it's it's interesting isn't it i th i think we, we're gonna um, turn it off too when, yeah we do turn it off yeah we yeah. have kids and we we really have a strong value in the quality of our life with our family and our off time. I think it's kept us sane because we have the occasional work conversation, but I don't know. We're pretty psyched to just like be with our kids in the weekend and look at other things in the world and not think about the office. It's funny that how we do turn it off well. I think that's a good key to it all really. The balance that we've talked yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> and we're thankful to have children. It definitely makes it harder to manage our time and we get creative and having our kids home a lot right now. It's been interesting because it's been great in that they really have seen more of what our work is every day. And, right. and I think that's been kind of a nice bonus. Um, but they really keep their children, keep us grounded in what's important. So it reminds us that we really just want to focus on work that we enjoy doing, you know, good clients we like to work with and that care about design. And we don't, we're not trying to like, you know, build a humongous firm and, and never have any time otherwise, you know, it's important value to us. How do you guys filter out bad clients <laughs> <laughs> or to frame it more well, positively? How do you keep good clients? Keep good clients. <laughs> or just in a roundabout way. I think it's, We've talked a bit about this because, you know, so I think larger firms or larger agency, agencies put a big effort into business development and sales and, and entertaining clients and bringing them in. And I think that's important, but I think we're a little quieter. And so by just showing that we care about our work and by doing the good work, we sort of bring the right clients in mm -hmm. and they come to us. Um, that's really how we get most of our work. And it kind of naturally filters people out so that we get pe like like-minded folks come to us with projects so it's been kind of interesting how that's worked out um i don't think that we would i think if you just start trying to get every client every project you have to you know be a little more open to whatever but we're kind of careful about it hmm. i think it helps it's part of maintaining that balance that we're talking about. Hopefully it'll keep working that way pretty well. <laughs> I've, I've talked to a couple people during this time. They've, they've said yes to everything and they're regretting it. Yeah, it's hard to do that. And like most of the residential clients are home more now and they're looking mm -hmm. at their designs more and they're doing more changes, mm -hmm. more feedback. It's, they become far more kind of an, not annoying, but like calling far more they often. They have a lot like, of ideas. It's good yeah. to have ideas about your home. We do our, we do a certain amount of residential. We we don't. It's not our top line of business, but and you can speak to this better. Yeah. But we like 
again, like-minded residential clients are really great. We like to work with them and help them out and do things. And then we have other folks we, we've kind of send people to if they just want, you know, like a reproduction of whatever. And we have some great folks we recommend those clients to. But how do you feel about your residential work? Yeah, it's... <laughs> I mean, it's, we love helping people, you know, in that, at that yeah, level Yeah, make too. their houses work for them. Right. But we, yeah. we do like to get sought out for that type of work and, uh, where people are like, oh, I love this work that you did. And, uh, right. I'm, we're like, thinking of doing something in our house. We don't know what we want, but we, we love these projects that you did, even though it's, it might be a brewery or a restaurant. We just love the detailing or the use of materials. So, you know, we, we get a lot of uh, feedback from people that go to one of our commercial projects and are like, we want to do this renovation or addition at our house or reclad it. And they come to us through that uh, outlet, which is interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a residential portfolio that people are, are looking for or seek us out when they do come mm -hmm. to us. Uh, so that's that naturally sort of uh, gets <laughs> us the right, to, to the right place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I you know in these times you do see there's we're, we're getting a lot more calls uh, about those types of projects uh, lately. Garages, and, additions. Yeah, sort of balancing out. I get it. Yeah. Meeting, meeting with people and it's almost like you're interviewing them to some extent. <laughs> yeah. As well as they are you, you know. Um, but you're good at just giving folks some advice too on what would make sense you know because it's yeah. good to have ideas some things cost more than others and yeah, sometimes people are just reaching out not sure if they need an architect who never worked with one and trying to figure out if it makes sense for the <laughs> yeah. type of project so usually try to offer as much advice as you can to get them You're really in the right direction that. yeah now uh what what's been your best failure that you've Ooh. learned from like what's the failure that you've learned the most from we should maybe name their particular project well i mean it's not a project we worked on do so you want to do a project we can failure? speak in generality or, right. so you don't lose any current clients yeah <laughs> well it's interesting because you're just talking about getting projects i was just thinking of their recent project we didn't get that we wanted to get mm. um right it's sort of a, you know, it's a developer's project, but a community project, and we we're really hoping to work on it. Um, but, you know, we just, we believe in wanting to put a high quality design out there and product. So we didn't, at the end of the day, we didn't make the cut. I think largely it was a financial reason. Uh, but when we, we felt kind of pained by that. We really wanted to do the project. Right. Right. Yeah. Like it was, yeah. it would have been a perfect fit for us, but we had to let it go. And that was a good lesson. And just like, I think in hindsight, it was a good call because it just wasn't a good fit. And it would have probably caused us a lot more stress and it kind of derailed us from the work we have at, at in house right now and maintaining good quality life. Like, I think it would right. have been a bad. It might, it might not have been a good project, so it was a good failure that we did that we did not get that project. So you guys pulled the plug as as far as like, you just don't think this is really. We just work didn't or? get chosen as architects. We yeah. we had to compete, which we don't do a ton of competing like that. And mm -hmm. it basically just they just came down to choosing architect based on fees. Right. And you know we can't always be the bottom fee because we just put more love into our work and. We have staff that we have to support. So we just did what we gave them. Still a good price, right. but yet not yes. the lowest. So um, we had to stick to our values on that and not just do anything to get the project. And I, I think sometimes you have to do that. Have you found a way to manage that, that pain that comes from seeing other competitors get work? <laughs> I don't know if we'll ever meet. No. <laughs> Yeah. What's the best way to manage that? I mean, we see a lot of things happen, especially in Portsmouth, where there's architecture that we we wish we could have worked on that just isn't looking. You know, I, I think it could definitely be better. And I think we take uh, comfort in knowing that we're doing our part to put good design in the world and we do have good projects going on. And if, you know not all architecture is going to be amazing architecture that gets put out in the world as a whole. You know, there's a lot of developments and things happening that are not what, what we would feel like good solutions, but you know, we're doing our part and we're, right. we have good projects. So 
kind of remind ourselves when we don't get all the projects that that's how do you feel about that brandon does it bother you seeing <laughs> no, <laughs> always me, no. yeah. <laughs> so yeah and the you know it's it is nice when you do if when you do lose that and then it comes out as a good project you're like all right at least it's like something i can walk by and still enjoy seeing and the, you, you don't see the yeah the failure in the the design you know it's like oh, that that's more selfless of you than i would be if i if i see a competitor <laughs> get a job and they knock out of the park i feel even worse because i'm like ah, oh, there's a real know. good reason now i didn't get that job you know like yeah I think it's it's we were talking about the differences too between like Portland and Portsmouth and the the views on architecture is a lot of heated, you know, yeah. perspectives and we just really love contemporary architecture and smart solutions and smart buildings and we're happy to see our colleagues design those. Honestly, it's such a battle where we live over that kind of thing and um I think the more the more exciting and smart buildings there are out there, the better for all of us. And it doesn't have to be our work, but yeah. that's just me. But it's, we get more upset when we see a not so great building go up and we wish we could have impacted it to be better for the community. Yeah, it's just, it is such a vastly different thing than photography. Photography is very, very, in the most part, very temporal, very quick turnover. And mm. it's a it's a much more quick turnaround on creative energy to uh execution yeah. easy to redo it well too yeah you know you can you just <laughs> like yeah the, keep moving the materials on. are less wasted right it's yeah like, you know so there's a lot of experimentation and, and everything else but yeah when something gets put into the ground and done yeah, poorly live with it for that is a different thing where it really uh it just feels like such a missed opportunity yeah i think that comes back to what you said our values about design i mean it's like really feeling in your heart, like how important this building will be for so many years to so many people and not just putting out something that's just good in the current time and just meets the price point and just for one purpose. You have to think bigger and longer in, t in terms of years and time and folks who might be impacted by what you're designing. I think it's it's so, you know, especially these days, you have to be really flexible and smart about what the future might be. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, let's see. I already tried to get out of you what you believe about our existence, but you guys. <laughs> Did we skirt around one. it? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm always interested in the architecture. I'm, I'm always interested <laughs> in the, the different outcome of principles and behavior compared against uh -huh. the foundational beliefs of people. So I've had plenty of people in here that are like atheists mm -hmm. that have the exact same morals, mm -hmm. the exact same divine principles as people who are very committed, you know, Christian, whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so it's, it's interesting yeah. to me in that, like, where's, where does the difference come out yeah. in these people on, on what they believe about the fabric of our reality and why we're here. It kind of seems like the end goal and what they're all trying to accomplish is still the best for everyone in this boat yeah. is, is still what everyone's aiming at, but they'd kind of uh, I see what pitch you're each other as being, well, they're yeah. gonna do the wrong thing because they don't, you guys are doing the same thing, trying to do the same thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. You just have different foundations of belief that inform right. it differently, but you still end up doing the same thing, which is interesting to me. Yeah, it is interesting. And that that complex thing of what is foundational to a person and what it turns into of them contributing to the world. Mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of Christians that want to say what I'm contributing is good because of what I believe, but I would say they're doing the exact same thing as people who don't believe the same thing to a right. large degree. So it's interesting to think about that way. Yeah. I just, you know, I think in design, it's just in our whole culture, there's a lot of just thinking about the present a lot. And I, I think to be responsible in design, you have to think beyond your lifespan. You have to think, more futuristically about the environment, about the well-being of our children and their generations to come. And 
and it comes down to how we build buildings and design things. And it's, yeah. I think it's hard for us as humans to think beyond our own like present tense, but um, hopefully that will shift a bit, you know? Right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Once you have kids, you realize how, how much of you actually does go on they're they're yeah. kind of like the same thing as you they're just the next iteration yeah and it, in that way you we do keep going on it's like right they've had foxes forever and you know we're gonna have foxes forever and they all look the same and they're doing the same thing and it's kind of like humans are the same thing but we have a lot more uh, sent, sentient self-reflective nature and we really manipulate our environment far more than, right. you know. So it's uh, the, the foundational beliefs and then how they turn into a built environment. And, and you compare culturally the mm -hmm. built environment of like Europe compared to America or Canada. We have, we kind of filtered for the initiation of this country as Western people coming over, the real whack jobs that would get on a boat and lead, you know, that's like people now going to Mars. Who's going to do that? It's going to be some real whack jobs. <laughs> so real whack jobs started this country <laughs> extremely <laughs> independent, mm -hmm. extremely uh, mm -hmm. self-motivated, self-oriented, you know? And so where in Europe they'd have an architect and an artist involved in a creation of a bridge. Here it's, let's get this done and move on. It's it's, it's a engineer, right? Yeah. It's a different culture and mentality, and so the it is. It's a lot of it's this, you know, planning and city planning and urban planning is it's such a thing because the developers, you know, there's a lot of good developers out there, but I think there's ones that are just, you know, it's so like short sighted. They're not trying to build a building for a hundred years down the line, right? You know, or tr trying to plan a city for you know a hundred years down the line, so. Places like Portsmouth really are affected by that right now. It's really like, it's a really good example or study, case study in how things can go. And I think um, city planning, especially if there's going to be a change in where people want to live and how things should work now, it could be a real opportunity to do smarter public space planning, urban planning, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and lay out communities in a way that benefits everyone and it's not just solely focused around, um, you know, the cost and the profit, which we, we all would hope would be the case, but. Yeah. That's a really interesting discussion too, where our, our built environment and our culture is going to change. I mean, the first really big immediate disruptor, I think, was like railway travel for mm -hmm. culture. And then the car was extremely disruptive. And then television and now, you know, smart devices, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. sure. And now yeah. with even with COVID now, people working remotely, I think there's going to be an awakening to how yeah. you can work differently. And, you know, things also like, living off grid and not mm -hmm. needing to be tied in and being able to work remotely. Like it, it you know, if you could well. do a science fiction novel to see where this goes without a dystopian future, but just, uh, you know, like what's our living situation going to look like 100, 200 years from now sure. because mm -hmm. of these influences, you know, that's. I think almost the pandemics put a real finer definition around experiences in a way, you know, because prior, especially like in the banking world, there's always been this kind of reluctance to use technology and trying to get people there. And now everyone wants to use their technology. That's why I'm with Bank of America. I, I bank yeah, at Bank of so America easy, and right? their, their online banking is amazing. Yeah. So it's, and they, so they've seen a real, there's been a real, it's been a game changer in trying to get folks on board with that. Really? Right? Cause yeah, because they, they, now they want to do everything on mobile, right? If they don't have to, there's still a big use of the financial center, but they, there's a wider acceptance of using technology now Yeah. as yeah. a result of the pandemic. I mean, I love, well, just even the, being able to deposit checks through your phone. That was huge. Super. I don't, Did well, we ever think that would the, happen? And here we go. Well, they closed <laughs> their branch here in Biddeford and they only yeah. have the one in Saco. Yeah. And in the summertime, on a normal summer, it's really hard to get over there because of the uh, bottleneck of traffic. 
for all the summertime yeah. stuff. Right. And so I don't have to go there at all. You know, I just right. deposit stuff online. People and, are going for other reasons yeah. um, across the country and depending on where, what the community looks like, you know, and how people, there's still long lines at certain teller lines. You know, it's really interesting to understand all that. But I think, well, there's a, you know, so we all are more excited to use technology now. So we don't have to put ourselves in places or, you know, expose ourselves if we don't want to. But at the same time, maybe we're all appreciating nature more and the quality of our environments more. Yeah. And you see so many so more people really out exercising right now. Yeah. Like sure. especially in March. Yeah. When we were away for a little bit and we came back and it was March, middle of March. No one's usually out doing anything mm -hmm. middle of March still. Yeah. They're just kind of yeah. like, ah. Everyone was out Everyone's walking out on the walking. beach, doing you know, and as soon as you're working in their home, gardens. Out, yeah, <laughs> part of it's like everyone's probably, outdoor space the gyms are at home. And yeah. It's more rec important. centers are closed, so people are looking for an outlet. It's just I think it's kind of defined a few experiences for people. Like when, what do I want to use technology for? What do mm. I want to use my outdoor space for? Where it's, things were kind of blurry, maybe a little more before, you yeah. know, and. Maybe it's it's kind of defined some of those things, and I think we'll see a result in how we build spaces out of it. Yeah, I think it sort of simplifies, you know, the idea of what you have to do on a daily routine now too, which has been interesting because yeah, we does notice that ourselves, it. where it's like, okay, now we're just doing this, you know. So you kind of step back a little bit, which has been kind of, I guess, I think the advantage to all of this, uh, all the chaos, and then kind of start to rebuild your life a little bit, which is yeah. Uh, some like yeah. re rejigging, but I think there'll be. I, I think it's like people have woken up from a slumber that that mm -hmm. have normal nine to five jobs. That's got to be such a rude awakening to be thrown out of that very consistent schedule. Mm -hmm. sure. All of a sudden, like you can, you, I think you acclimate to how much you can be in pro close proximity with even your close loved ones and everything else. That domestic violence is through the roof, I guess now and. Mm. And all that kind of yeah, stuff yeah. because you've taken people out of their routine, their normal environment and everything else. My life is usually so chaotic just for scheduling and everything mm. else. One day is never like the next. And I love that. I thrive on that and it, it makes me feel alive and I get my consistency and comfort where I design it in. But for people that I know appreciate routine, schedule and consistency, this has to have been a very, very disruptive thing that they kind of wake up from or go to sleep too, I don't know. But it's there's got to be some realizations from this whole thing that yeah. they're going to change design and... How people work. Yeah. But like you were saying, an uh, appreciation of their built environment, just getting outside at different times of the day now, mm -hmm. probably, you know, and yeah. I mean, we just started going back in our office. Um, it, we kind of come in at different times, different teams, and we're all spaced out. So it's, we have a really beautiful office. So for us, I think a lot of us realize, like we love being in our office and being amongst each other, but we've also liked some of the time we've had at home to be there as well. And a lot of us have kids at home and we just have to be flexible, you know, right. we can't. And I think that it's nice that the, the kind of culture right now is, everyone's more open-minded to how we each need to work right now. Like, I'm okay if you're on the phone with me and your kid is screaming or your right. dog is barking or if you're in the office or you're not in the office. Are you going to work at night instead of the morning? Like, I think it's a good thing for our society to allow people to work the way it works for them as long as they can do their work, you know, and especially for creative people. Yeah. We all work a bit different. I think and being so rigid like you have to be here at these times and you know it, it doesn't work great for everybody so I, I I like the more open minded nature of things now I think it's been a good thing for many but I think routine people yes but they just have to make their own routine and right. maybe they rethink part of the routine because they have more choices I don't know have you guys thought much about how you work and produce creatively how you manage that and help it thrive yeah. we've had some of it's been hard and some of it's worked better than we thought right yeah sure like are you finding your you know especially in architecture like it's hard to 
you can't all sit around and look at a drawing and get up close and sketch. And that's been a bit hard, right? Yeah, we've adapted remotely to doing these things that you used to just do so casually and which just had this fluidness to it that was really nice. And we tried to keep that going with this mm -hmm. you know, kind of remote technology and it it works, but not, it's just not the, it's not the same thing. And everyone right. kind of acknowledges that. Um, but you're kind of, you know, adapting to that as well and making it work in ways that you would have never even considered it before. So I think that's, those are things like in terms of the, keeping the collaboration going is sort of yeah. been this huge thing, but we're seeing just, just being back in the same space again, it's, it's much more casual and easier, uh, to communicate yeah. and collaborate, but, on um, certain ways. And yeah. For our, for our work. Yeah. And other <laughs> so ways, right? interesting. It's like, but then you have to be kind of in the space at that's at that yeah. same time together. So there, it, it creates, uh, you need, it's, it felt so good. I was yeah. in this morning and I saw designers and it felt good. It was probably less productive because we were so excited to see each other and we were chit chatting. <laughs> we were just like, a, la la, talking about there'll stuff. There'll be a curve of efficiency. Yeah, to work but into. you need that yeah. too. And yeah. when it's so much high tech work all the time, I feel like we all need our low tech breaks, like where we're just sketching or just talking or. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like a, you really notice that more now too with your time. Like I'm, I gotta like step away from the screen for a little while, go outside, right? Whereas before you probably just grind it out in the office all day and then not even notice like we didn't even go like outside. Get out of here by five <laughs> to get to practice. <laughs> yeah, so it's really making things more distinctive. I think it's interesting. Um, what is the riskiest creative decision you've both made so far? Hmm. Oh, it's creative decision. Creative decision. Mm -hmm. You uh, had some good contemporary. Maybe you should talk about one of those I think Portsmouth ones. Yeah, some yeah. Because you had a lot of support for some of your risky, like more contemporary ideas. Yeah, we kind of push these <laughs> kind of contemporary design ideas in the historic districts, with, which in Portsmouth is. Can, mm. can be more of a challenge than kind of taking the easier path uh, to an approval, you know, and, and same thing, like those are the clients that kind of want to do something a little more unique or uh, more current or more contemporary kind of seek us out for that work. But um, yeah, there was the, uh, I'm trying to think of the, uh, the glass atrium. That was oh yeah, I love that project. One, yeah, it was it, it was one. It got um, approved too. It yeah, didn't get built. It, was, it was it was one of the it was one of the few uh, contemporary buildings left in Portsmouth from that kind of fifties era of construction. Yeah, and uh, so it had this kind of nice mid century feel to it, and they but it just it didn't quite work from an accessibility standpoint. So uh, we kind of did this uh, contemporary kind of glass edition with this cool pattern and. Uh, we really had to kind of push the envelope to get uh, get the HTC on board, but we you know, ultimately got got their unanimous approval. And uh, after after a lot of heartache, and uh, not and uh, in the end, I think one of the comments was, uh, "If I am pay, can have his Louvre, and uh, Colbin can have his glass cube in Portsmouth." <laughs> <laughs> it's like this. Uh, what a moment! Uh, yeah, 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 and then and then sadly the the project ended up uh, they just they tore up, down the they, building. They, they sold it to somebody, and they ended up tearing tearing the whole building down and building this reproduction. Uh, oh, colonial building. building. Yeah, so we like so, saving yeah. buildings like that. You know, yeah, yeah. Some, oh, yeah. some older weird buildings in Portsmouth. Some have been saved. Some have been torn down. Sadly, but. People get, they're so, you know, blindsided by the fact that they're out of date or whatever and just assume they're ugly. And we always think there's a way to make them cool and right. kind of preserve that time in, in history that they were created. Right. You know, they're all of some value. A good building's a good building. Yeah. Using that infrastructure, you know, the, all that effort that went into that building and trying to. So that was, that was probably one, I could add that one to your heartbreak list too of yeah, projects yeah. didn't get built, but I thought. Uh, that was a risky, you know, I think it's cool how you put some contemporary ideas. I think probably a good percentage of them have been supported by the Historic District Commission, which is good to see. There's been a few that were more painful and you had to make concessions to get the project done. Sure. Um, the press room. Like the press room. Yeah. And th those are, uh, you put, you still put the risk out there. Right. And the design was good. It's just that the community or the 
the board couldn't accept the risk, I guess, is the thing of it. Yeah. And so it's just funny. It's really been interesting getting to work on those projects. Yeah. What is the project that you've had the most uh, fulfillment and kind of pride that you were involved in uh, so far? 3S. 3S Art Space. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 3S Art Space is cool also because it, it's the first project we really worked on together. Um, Before we, our business. Yeah. We didn't have a business together at the time. I was consulting and he worked at an uh, architecture firm in Portsmouth. Um, and so great organization, arts and culture, like very cool gallery, restaurant, performance space concept. And we were involved in a lot of it, fundraising and everything. And then now, and you guys were involved in it, in it from different perspectives. A bit, yeah. Kind of. Yeah. So he was the ar architect of record. Is that how we put project. it? Yep. Official yep. project architect. Yeah. Um, for the, the building renovation that happened. And we spent a lot, of, we talked about our project a lot in our household, just the architecture even, like I had a lot of ideas and, and you were really working on yeah, trying to make it work and cost effective. Committee, you were a founding board member. Yeah, you know, so we cared a lot about it. Yeah. And we, that's probably a good example of a project we talked about a lot in our personal life. Right. So yes. those kinds of things happen, but that's fun for us talking about ideas. I remember like in Connecticut driving and we were talking about the building siding. <laughs> like how do we make this building siding cool, but cost effective? We're like, we got to push the envelope. And we had such a great conversation and really the design came out of it. Yeah. The, so it was uh, like this rusted metal rusted industrial metal, look. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, and then I worked on the, I designed the wayfinding for the building. So there's, um, several signs on the outside of the building there's like kind of one that wraps the corner and then some stuff on the interior and there's a donor wall i designed so it was so cool to, for me to design those pieces into the building that brandon developed and to have a whole finished product it was very very rewarding we, we have a lot of pride in that project you know our kids get to see the result and go there and yeah, that's yeah. a really great project I also won an award, sure, yeah. which is cool. Oh, so I <laughs> forgot to mention then in the intro, you guys are award-winning architects. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So yeah. you had mentioned you're working on a museum right now. Yeah. 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 And you've done some work on breweries and stuff. Well, that's a whole like sub menu in, in your website. So talk me through okay. museum and and breweries. Yeah. So museum. So this. Again, I think a lot of the experience from 3S kind of led us to this, uh, again, another nonprofit group looking for this kind of big master plan, you know, and then again, it's for the entire site. So that, that was, it's been a lot of fun to work on, very rewarding. And, and this group is very interesting. I mean, it, it's a whole group of veterans that uh, kind of are, are running this, uh, this board and uh, the committees, the different committees to kind of keep the, the site relevant and the idea and the concept there for future generations. And that's what they were kind of starting to worry about. I was like, we really need to do something more here. So it, so it brings people in for, uh, you know, the generation to come here. And, um, it was really cool just getting to know those people and yeah. kind of hear their story and their connection to the submarine and the technology where people that serve. Oh, is this for the Albacore? The Albacore Museum. Oh, yeah. Cool. yeah. So we're developing yeah. a whole, which, which right now is really just the sub and they have this yeah. really small little, uh, gift shop and, uh, visitor center you know oh great and um i yeah. took my son there when i had to deliver a photo job to a woman who had a hair salon i believe this is a long time ago and my son who's now 10 he was probably a year and a half at the time and we i met the woman close to that area and i was like oh i think the albacore thing is over here we gotta go so i have pictures of my son and they're like on the plotting yeah, table so or something cool. yeah, you know yeah, and it's yeah, just yeah. kind of like what is this place? <laughs> what is it's like a submarine sitting there yeah. it's amazing it's so really what amazing. is uh what is going on with with that project very is it gonna preliminary be a, yeah it's a little under the radar it's not really out in the public the design so much yet yeah. they're they're kind of carefully plotting it out but it's really to, to make a, a bigger experience there so more people can learn and visit the museum, you know, learn and visit 
more types of exhibits and learning experiences because the, the current museum is so small and the, the submarine's awesome, Yeah, you know, but they have a lot of things to tell and share about submarine innovation. And then they have the whole memorial aspect. Um, they have a memorial park there and they hold a lot of events and the culture and um, the history of submarine life is so important in our region. So they have a lot they want to do. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? Yeah, it's a big thing. A lot of them have connections with the Portsmouth mm -hmm. Naval Shipyard yeah. and yeah, like some of them, and you know, design some of these submarines. So they yeah. were engineers working on the yeah. yeah one design. of the guys some on the board on the, on the submarines and the, the ships that really were on the shipyard. just love those guys. I yeah, mean, they have group. incredible stories. And they care so much about like leaving a legacy, you know, yeah. for folks to understand what they all did and the technology that goes into submarines. And there's it's a real labor labor of love. So that's exciting because we just feel so like tied to wanting to help them. And also, it's just such a great opportunity to make an important place, you know, on the landscape for for the public to enjoy. So oh, now funny. is the whole thing going to be underwater or? No, well, that would been, be cool. There's been talk of that. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, maybe. Yeah. Occasional, <laughs> occasional depth they, charge. They like to keep the water out. You know, getting the yeah. submarine there. You know, they basically that was a thing in itself. Right? Yeah, uh, they floated it in and then yeah. kind of closed it off. Dug so a right. it's a, it's quite it's an ongoing feat actually to keep the the submarine dry dock there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's really cool. So that's a dream project and. We're so excited to be working on it, and we're going to put a lot of love into that project for sure. Yeah, yeah. very cool. Oh, yeah, I'll be excited to see how it comes out. I need to take my two boys to go see the Albacore now that they're a little older. They'd, yeah, they'd be pretty psyched it's on one that. of the most visited museums, you know, on the, the seacoast. Seacoast. A lot yeah, of us who yeah. live there kind of take it for granted, but it's an important place. It, it would be nice if it had, it's really close to the highway, yeah. but you don't really see it from the highway. Yeah, they're working you know, on If you that, had a big yeah. neon interior lit sign with yeah. an arrow or something, you know, yeah. I don't know. Big Just giant. ideas. I'm throwing them out there. You can take them if you want. You know. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Uh, yeah, so breweries, what what do you have going on with breweries? And so breweries, so yeah, nothing active at the moment. We just sort of finished. We have a, um, a design that's sort of paused right now down in Newburyport, Mass. That has a, a site for a brewery that's been approved. And we completed, uh, uh, it's a, mixed use campus style site that has mm -hmm. a, an old farmhouse with this new contemporary edition. Oh, cool. And then there's a, a new barn that we're building as a function hall space and then a bar, a, a brewery industrial brewery building on the back of the site. So that, that one's sort of, uh, working on, uh, working its way forward, but, um, we're just about to break ground on the other, the two front buildings. And then the brewery is, is, uh, lagging a little bit behind that, but, um, that, that one will be exciting that comes around and there is so it's a developer that's that's building the uh the building and looking for a tenant for the site so oh okay yeah, so there's yeah. been a few different yeah if anybody so there's there's no it. actual <laughs> brew brewer that's <laughs> taking it over yet but someone's no, developing it. Yeah, there's conversations yeah. with some and uh yeah we're trying to uh seal the deal there hmm. but again uncertain times it's, it's it's been exactly. interesting with breweries, right? Since your whole career path happened, because in the beginning, breweries were just kind of like started being exciting as far as visiting breweries. Yeah, you know? in the last five to 10 years, yeah. they've exploded with like microbreweries. So you kind of have been working through that time. And now it's, I think people realize the importance of a place like a brewery to create like an active like destination you yeah. know where it's not just a brewery but there's also like public space or other mixed uses yeah, like a brewery is always like and we need a brewery because it's the experiential part of it i think mm. it's become people like that sort of casual hangout brewery atmosphere well and being close to yeah. the making instead of people right. buying their beer Connected. from someplace off they're like there where it's being made and it's more authentic and sure. more and unique that. experience you know, people want unique things so breweries have been a great example yeah. of how that works we just well last summer york beach York Beach Beer Company York and Beach uh, Beer Short Company. Sands mm -hmm. in York, oh, cool. Maine. That's a fun little spot for sure. Yeah, that's a fun one. And I've adapted reuse of this old post office building, you know, 50s yeah. post, post office building. We have a really nice old post office here in Bitterford that's oh. still sitting empty. It's a standalone. We could have our office there. That's right. 
Do Just it. Kidding. Someone, we won't leave Kittery, but it will be a second office. But that, that building, we love those buildings. Since 2003, has sat empty like that. Really? And in oh, right be before Perry. we moved here, supposedly some investor from Hong Kong bought it for five thousand dollars <laughs> because they said we're going to do great and amazing things, and they just flipped it. Oh, and so wow. it's just kept changing hands and nothing gets done with it. But it's, it out. it's yeah. super nice. It's, it's right over across from Palace Diner, if you know where Palace oh, Diner is. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, oh, that even makes it a better spot. Yeah, Palace Diner is pretty amazing, too. Yeah, that's a great example of lasting good design, those post yeah. office prototypes. Yeah. You know, just a smart, oh, wait, no, cool building. Uh, Courthouse. Oh, courthouse. Yeah. courthouse. Oh, uh, cool. Courthouse. But yeah, it's still, we actually did, okay, so we, we did measurements for a post office when I was first here working with a friend of mine, Caleb Johnson, as an architect. Oh, nice. Um, we did like renovation or existing drawings for a post office down in Kittery area. And it, yeah. it's, it was like in a strip mall or something. Yeah. Uh, but they where tributary brewing is yeah, yeah they yeah. they had yeah. this Next walkway of like separate yeah. space yeah. where people could come in through the skinny door on the outside of the post office yeah. from the postmaster general place whatever they could come in and watch through one-way mirrors people sorting mail oh wow like it's a whole sneaky thing you go yeah. to any of the post office built in <laughs> up to the 90s i think yeah they'll have a separate door with just a slit on it Oh, and wow. it'll be skinnier, and y if you look for it, you'll find it. And that door will connect just to a hallway that goes to these things like where you viewing. can put your head in and look down on everyone working in the post office. So if you go into the post office, a lot of times you'll see them, and there'll be these one-way mirror there, little things that peek out like this. Mm. And when we were there measuring, we were like, what are these things? You know, Because we were back in the mailroom doing all the stuff, and they're mm -hmm. like, oh, Anytime a federal official can come and walk in there and, and observe what we're doing. Wow. And they said that they got in there once and there, it was just all dust. No one had been in there for like decades, hmm. I guess. Yeah, and never got used. But I keep looking at any post office I go in and there's another one. There's another. You know, it's it's a really weird thing. I don't, oh, wow. Kind of. Well, that and that whole, you know, post office, what they what we need them for and what, you know, I think thinking about those spaces, you know, and the the evolution of the postal service yeah would be a fun thing to study because they're important public places you know and and how well, can like we libraries yeah mm. who needs a library Maybe anymore they need to join forces <laughs> yeah we just yeah. get approved the new library in kittery um because I think the the community wants the public space you know yeah just maybe not thought about in traditional times but yeah uh, it's important. These public places and their their kind of adaptation is important. Right. Yeah, how civic space fits into yeah. the, the new community. Yeah. yeah. So that that sums up all the questions I mostly had. The other thing is I wonder there with all the microbreweries happening and now the legal legalization of marijuana across the country, mm. I'm starting to run into architects that are doing these breweries but for disp dispensaries. Yeah, dispensaries. dispensaries which is like a high-end retail yeah basically mm -hmm. a high-end retail thing with exactly. a lot of security up front i guess yeah so. yeah. yeah interesting yeah. huh yeah. yeah it's an interesting business model for sure yeah and it's still such a gray legal area too it's sure. still i don't think still federally legal so you're taking this huge risk of yeah, yeah, the yeah. but there's part. so much potential there that people are doing it be nice so. to see some yeah. people do it well as far as design you know like when we, we went to colorado last year and there's some great architecture and design ideas coming out of creating those spaces and yep. i think it's nice to see it elevated and and thoughtfully done so that would be a fun thing to work on actually yeah we don't have, well, there's a couple cropped up in Kittery, but it's kind of limited right now mm. in our region, but yeah. definitely going to be something happening there <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Changes are happening. Yeah, yeah. Got to be flexible. That's for sure. <laughs> Change is the constant, I guess. Yeah. So. Keeps designers busy. Yeah. You know, and they say like in times of rapid change, like that's the most prolific time in design history. Yeah. 
So things like pandemics and world wars and, you know, those things really accelerate design. Um, well, and innovation, so interesting. like yeah. uh, supposedly Newton came up with a lot of his stuff during one of the plagues that, you know, yeah. that he sequestered himself. And yeah. a lot of the great literary works came out of those times when people were just isolated and working away. kind of thing. I think it's true. Cause and it's I built a porch. So. Yeah, so we're all doing things. <laughs> it forces you to stop and like adjust, yeah. which if we all just keep going on and on without any like, you know force change then maybe we wouldn't think of these ideas so yeah it's going to be interesting mm -hmm. well for thank you for coming all the way up from sure. kittery and uh hanging out talking yeah, yeah we like coming to better for we're actually working on a, a project for university of new england doing oh, really? a new wayfinding oh up in portland or here in both Biddeford? campuses both campus, to yeah. do redesign their wayfinding yep. uh, for the campus experience and uh Biddeford's gotten to know it a little bit more and it's such a great place yeah i think it's a yeah it you is. should you should definitely check out the courthouse on your way yeah. out it's over by tidbit there. palace diner just put it in the back of your head maybe you yeah. should you maybe know. yeah i could also go for some palace diner <laughs> <laughs> yeah we were we were actually doing a uh some video production for a local politician i was helping him out we were filming over near there and some woman from Kenny Bunkport came up in like a nice new Mercedes. This is Bitterford, like probably even four years ago. And it yeah. was a little more rough even then, right? She pulls up in this brand new, nice Mercedes. She had like the beaver cleaver mom's <laughs> like dress and pearls, perfectly oh, done boy. hair. Mm -hmm. yeah. And she jumped out of her car in the middle of downtown Bitterford. 7-Eleven's right over there and that's a sketchy place. And, but she jumped out, she was all excited. She was like, I just read about this place on Bon Appetit. Where is it, is it open? You know, and bon it's just like, what is going on? This is crazy. Yes. Yeah, that place is good. A lot of attention. Yeah, it's good, so. but then you can't get in there. The local people, you got to wait in line or you got to wait. Yep. <laughs> hey, that's, it's, that's pretty cool. It's, you know, it, it, uh, it, it limits the availability, makes it even cooler. And, right. You know, it's all yeah. about the cool factor. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, walk walk around Bitterford, check it out, spread the gospel of Bitterford, you know. I, do, so. I think it's very uh it's going through a nice revitalization. I hope I hope the artists and everyone who's Well, I hope set Bitterford makes art its yeah. thing that yeah. it's known for and protects that because like Portland's just an all around city, right? Sure. Freeport has the uh <clears throat> the outlets, you know. Yeah. And Kitteries, more outlets as well. But like if Bitterford could be some type of like, oh, if, if you want a good, you know, great, uh, you know, unique furniture or art yeah. or any of that, like Bitterford's a real it Almost reminds that. me of like the mass mocha thing that happened out there. You no know, doubt. you have great yeah. big buildings here, great opportunity for artists to be here. And I, that'd be great if you could embrace it and sort of reserve space and things like that for artists. Right. I think it, it pays off in the end. And yeah, we love what Engine's doing in here. It's yeah, like we yeah, really we're just that. losing Tammy now, so I hope we can find oh, someone her mm. caliber to replace her. She's been amazing for yeah. what yeah. she's been doing uh, for the downtown. Yeah, so. yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. That. hopefully it's a good opportunity here for that, for sure. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot going on that way, so. Nice. Again, thanks for coming thanks, up, Trent. visiting Biddeford, and talking with us for a bit. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks. It was cool. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks thank for you. having us.